this later. Okay, so now we're recording. Great. Uh, so when you download Super Collider, uh, you'll see a window that looks something like this, um, which is uh, you've got your big uh, text field on the left. That's where you type your code, where you evaluate your code, where you do all of your work. And then there are these panels on the right. So we've got our help browser in the upper right. And we've got our post window on the bottom right. So uh, obviously the help browser is where you can look up implementations of classes and methods and see how things work. And the post window is where the language will uh, return the result of your evaluated code. It's also where we see error messages. Um, I just want to uh, make sure the, the chat is working. So if you want to just say hi or just type something real quick, that would be awesome just to make sure I'm talking to some people out there. Um, right, so these, these, uh, hey, hey, Blink, the uh, B Hinks, gotcha. Nice. Hey, Justin. Uh, so these, these, uh, uh, docklets, I guess they're called, can be, you can just grab them and move them around. Uh, you can have them sort of be free floating. You can also, uh, tuck them in, in, you know, on the edges and in the corners. Uh, and if you click on this little icon here, you can, um, I think also just, let's see, you can, yeah, detach them completely so they become a sort of separate window and reattach them uh, to tuck them back in. So you could sort of customize a little bit. Uh, we've got our preferences dialog here. Not too much you really uh, need to be messing around with here, but I do want to point out uh, you can change the your color scheme if you want. You can change your uh, font size, your default font size and font face. Um, and then there are a bunch of keyboard shortcuts, um, most of which have a key binding, but um, uh, some don't. And there are two in particular that I really like having a hotkey for. And the first one is uh, boot server. And the other one is quit server, just because I'm constantly booting and quitting the server. Uh, so that's just a good, uh, I think one of those by default has a key binding, maybe the other one doesn't. But anyway, you can poke around in preferences and just sort of get comfortable with that. Um. <coughs> All right, so Super Collider is a, an audio programming language for real-time sound synthesis and processing and algorithmic uh, tools and things like that. And uh, it, it looks like one program, but it's actually uh, two programs. I, I guess maybe even three, if you count the IDE itself. But uh, there's the, the language or the interpreter, which is just uh, which is called SC Lang. That's where all the code evaluation happens, that's where the interpreter lives, the class library, that sort of thing. And then there's the audio synthesis engine called SC Synth. And uh, when you open Super Collider, the interpreter is uh, active by default. You can see the little green word active down here. And the server is off. And the way we um, uh, awaken the server is by sending it the boot message. And so uh, we can go to server and say boot server or use our key binding and that throws a bunch of uh, text into the post window here just confirming that we're booting the server and then we should see sort of the green green numbers so the server's awake and we can also quit the server using the same menu but we can also boot the server using code and so uh, touched on this a little bit on Thursday but uh, to evaluate code, uh, you uh, if you have a single unbroken line with, with no return characters, you can just place the mouse cursor uh, anywhere on it. It doesn't have to be at the end or beginning, in the middle, and hold shift and press return. And uh, this particular line of code, server.local.boot, has the same effect as just going to the menu and booting the server. And as you can probably guess, we can also quit the server in the same way. Um, so just to examine this uh, 
offline for a little bit, uh, there is a class of objects called server, and we are sending that class the method local, which returns the instance of the local SC synth server on our machine, and then we're sending the boot message to the local server. So uh, in this particular construction here, uh, server is the receiver of the local message. Server is a class, local is a method or a message. And that returns something, and then we can then chain more messages together like this. Um, if you want to get help on a uh, class or method, you can, uh, uh, well, you can highlight it. And uh, the key binding for look up something in the help documentation is Command D on Mac and Control D on Windows and Linux. And so here's our, our help file for the server class. I think the same works for methods too, if we just highlight local. And so we can see that local is defined for the server class. So we can click on that and it'll, it should automatically take us to the local method. And then there's a little bit of text that tells us what that method does. It uh, gets or sets the instance of the local server. Um, so this is all kind of jargony, but uh, I mean, this, there are much simpler examples we can do for sending messages to uh, objects. Uh, for example, we can say uh, five dot uh, squared. So this um, sends the squared message to the number five. And in the post window, we see we get the result, which is 25. So just again, just shift enter anywhere on the line. And uh, you'll also notice that, I mean, it's just uh, one thing you'll probably want to find yourself doing all the time is, is clearing the post window, just because, especially if you're working with a lot of code uh, and you're printing a lot of things to the post window, it gets really cluttered really quickly. One way you can do it is by right clicking and saying clear. And I've, uh, I think there is uh, a key binding for clearing the post window uh, by default. And I think it is shift command P or shift control P. Yeah, shift command P. So it's just nice to be able to clean that up so we can very clearly see the result of what we're evaluating. Right, so shift shift enter is for evaluating a single line of code. Uh, but the the way the the superplatter platform is sort of set up is the interpreter is, is very dynamic and interactive. So you don't you're not always stuck evaluating one single line or one single block. You can actually highlight uh, what you want to evaluate. So if you press shift enter while some text is highlighted, it will only evaluate that code. So uh, for example, if we try to uh, quit the server, but we have server.local highlighted, uh, it only gives us what server.local returns, which is the name of the localhost audio server. But if we highlight that whole line, um, sorry, and then shift enter and the server quits. Okay. And uh, server.local, that localhost uh, name, is actually stored by default in the global variable s. So if we just evaluate s, and if you're following along, you should be able to do this as well. Just s on a single line should uh, print localhost in the post window. So that means we can just say s.boot instead of server.local.boot. Okay. Uh, so let's um, let's make a little bit more sound. So let's see, we um, we made some pink noise earlier, and so the way we make sound in SuperCollider, the, the one of the ways we can make sound, this is sort of the quick, uh, shortcutty kind of way, is we make a function with curly braces, and we send it uh, the play message. So we can sort of put anything in here. We'll do pink noise again, like we did at the very top of the stream. Uh, pink noise AR, and uh, we could stop here, and this um, this means we're going to get full amplitude pink noise, so I'm actually going to multiply this by 0.2, and then if we uh, run this line, uh, again, we could do shift return to run this line, and it's going to make some pink noise, so before I do that, I just want to be uh, sort of looking ahead and uh, remind you that the way to stop all sound that the server is producing is command period, on Mac, control period on Windows and Linux. So I'm gonna shift enter on this line and then command period. Right. So you should all be able to hear that. We can 
change the uh, amplitude as well. You'll also, if you're on headphones or um, listening with some sort of stereo system, you'll notice that this is only coming out of the left speaker, and that's that's normal in this case. All all of these uh, signal processing unit generators are monophonic, or at least like 90-something percent of them are monophonic by default. Um, oops. All right. So uh, let's um, let's just take a step back. We'll we'll come back to we'll leave the server booted, but we're gonna let's talk a little bit more about functions and evaluating code, and uh, giving things uh, names. Uh, so uh, let's let's make another function, but this one's gonna have nothing to do with sound. So we'll say um, uh, let's see, I don't know. Let's go five squared again. So if we make this function, um, uh, if we just sort of run it, um, it's going to say a function in the post window. So this is, this is, I think this general concept is true for a lot of programming languages where you can make a function, it contains some code, but the process of defining the function and uh, actually executing the function are two separate things. Uh, so I... I I don't think anything would happen if we try to play this. Um, uh, we might hear like a, a sort of a big pop at the beginning and then a pop when we stopped it because it's just trying to send the number 25 to the um, to the DAC, to the speakers. So we're not going to do that. But um, uh, functions in general uh, can be evaluated by the value method. So if we say 5.squared as a function dot value, that actually defines the function and then runs the code in the function. Um, and we could save this um, as, as, let's call it x. So now x is uh, the function 5 dot squared. So now we can say x dot value. <coughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, these variable names. I mean, so I, I can just say x. I can just conjure up x. Is that, is that the situation? I mean, if we say... Um, uh, let's say uh, my uh, func. So I'm going to clear the post window and run this again. And so we get our first error message here. So uh, it says error variable my func not defined. It worked fine for x, um, but it, it didn't work for my func. So uh, in Super Collider, the um, single lowercase uh, uh, alphabetic characters are what are called interpreter variables. And I think the, the right way to think about these is they're just a convenience. Um, if, you, if you're just testing some stuff or just kind of sandboxing around, it's nice to be able to say, OK, I just need, I need some persistent uh, variable that's going to just stick around. So f equals 6, great. So we'll just run that. And now here we can say f plus 3, that's 9, plus 10. So f is, f is now this uh, persistent quantity. Right, six. And even we could even open up a new uh, super collider document, and f uh, here as well has kept its value. So it's this. Uh, these twenty six um, variables are are available for use and whatever you want. Obviously, a single lowercase character is not a very meaningful variable name. So you know they are what they are. And and s is one of these. But by convention, s is sort of reserved for the local host server because that's an, a thing you're going to be talking to quite a lot in Super Collider. So we could very easily just say, okay, S is now 1. But I'm not going to run this line because then we can't do s.boot anymore. Um, so you do have those at your disposal, so this is fine. But if we want to give this function a more meaningful name than x, uh, you know, like something with multiple characters, we can't say my func and just, just do it like this. Uh, but we can proceed uh, a longer variable name with a tilde. And what this does is it uh, has the effect of, of using the environment variable, my func. So uh, now my uh, func is now our function, and we can evaluate it. And this will behave just like the single lowercase variable um, x or f or whatever. It's persistent across multiple documents. Um, so so this is a, a really good concept to keep in mind because I, I, I certainly find myself using environment variables all the time. Um, uh, 
because uh, you they sort of you know any any environment variable always exists and just you know so if we just pick another one so call it something and we just say okay what is what is its value it's nil and nil is a special value assigned to things that haven't yet been given a value so this is a good way for making variables if you um, if you're just going to be sort of using them here and there uh, that that's not to say that we um, we can't uh, use a multi-character variable name without invoking the tilde as well. So the way we need to do this, uh, if we want to make a function called myfunc, is we need to declare the variable using a var statement. And uh, so now, uh, you know, it, uh, what we have to do is run these together. Um, so uh, we can highlight all of this and press shift enter and we didn't see any error messages but when you declare a variable using a var statement uh, this is a local variable which means um, the scope of my funk is limited to the code that was evaluated by the interpreter which means if we now go and say my funk uh, it's gone right it's we, we defined it locally as the function five dot squared but that's it um, so if we actually want to do something with it, it has to be within this, this uh, clump. So we can say my funk uh, dot value uh, plus eight. Okay. So now if we run these three lines together, clearing the post window first, we get thirty three. So uh, and again, right? We, that that's gone. We can we can maybe say, okay, I want to save the the results and. Um, so now run these three here and okay we've got another variable that we didn't uh, define so we've got to uh, put it up here and so we've we've saved it as results but once again um, the result you know this this value of 33 which we bothered to produce is now actually not stored anywhere persistent um, so the bottom line with global variables and local variables is that there you'll find some situations where it makes a lot of sense to use a global variable, like a, a single lowercase letter or something with a tilde, because you're going to be running several things in several separate code evaluations, and you want those values to persist. But there are some cases when you're just doing a small sort of sub-function where you're just using a, a counter to sort of, you know, just any, any sort of little uh, isolated process where it's it doesn't it's not really necessary to make a permanent uh, persistent variable, but instead just to um just declare something local, just var num, and then just do something, you know, push the results somewhere, make a sound, or produce some global variable, and then you don't need num anymore. So it's um uh, so that's that's the essential difference between local and global variables. It's sort of different different contexts for each. Um, uh, another thing I want to point out is that having to sort of highlight this if every time we want to run this, um, sort of awkward. You can imagine if we had a lot of code and it all had to be run as the same locally scoped clump, um, it's it's annoying to have to click and drag or highlight a bunch of stuff. And shift enter is is just going to run the current line. So and these these are really bound together. So uh, we can enclose. Uh, Close uh, any any uh, any clump of code in parentheses using this syntax here, and then we can use a different keystroke to run the uh, clump. So uh, instead of Shift Enter, you just click anywhere inside the clump, and uh, Command Enter or Control Enter, and you can see that we get a little flash of everything inside the parentheses. So we can see it's all being evaluated at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So if anyone has any questions as we go along, it's uh, we're sort of just covering topics uh, as we go, trying to stay in a reasonable order, logical progression. But feel free to chime in at any time if you've got got a question. Uh, let's let's. I mean, this this function is a like you know, really a painfully simple function. It doesn't really. It, it's you know it's kind of ironically named function because it's not very functional. So, um, you know, let's say we wanted to have a function whose job it is 
to uh, to uh, square an incoming value, right? Um, let's actually space this out a little bit. And I also want to take this moment to point out that uh, SuperCollider is generally extremely forgiving with white space. Um, you know, you don't have to put spaces between operators um, or between uh, comma separated items. Uh, basically, it, it doesn't see space characters or uh, return characters with, I guess, very maybe very few exceptions. Um, so in in the um, in our function, uh, let's say um, we're going to make uh, we want to be able to pass in a value to uh, the function. So we'll say arg input. So we're declaring an input argument to a function, and what we're going to do is uh, square the input. <coughs> And then we'll say result equals my func dot value uh, five plus eight. So right, that works as well. What we've done is uh, we've declared an argument, we square it, and that's how our function is defined. And so when we actually call upon the function to to run, we execute the function, we have the option of passing in a value. Uh, in parentheses right after the value method. So we can say 6. That gives us 6 squared plus 8, 7 squared plus 8. And uh, uh, we can also provide a default value here, something like, I don't know, let's just say 1. So now if we don't provide a value, it's going to use the default value of 1. 1 squared is 1, plus 8 is 9. Um, but we can also override that default value. And um, you know maybe maybe we want to save this result so to use it in some other part of our code in a separate code evaluation, in which case a local variable wouldn't work. So we might want to do uh, result with a tilde. and there's in that case, there's no need to declare a um, a local variable. So then we can run this. and then somewhere later on, we now have access to, result, which is permanent, but of course, without the tilde, it uh, it's undefined. Okay. Let's see what else. Uh, right. I do. I do want to spend uh, some time with sound, so I do want to sort of get back to sound here. Uh, I I think generally I just sort of enjoy the um, uh, global variables or environment variables just because uh, I just find them very convenient. So we're going to do that. We're going to make a, a sound function called tilde sound. And let's make a variable called um, signal. Um, a lot of people, I, get, I, I often get the question, what's the difference between arguments and variables? Like arg something, var something. Uh, an arg uh, is I, I um, sorry, but the equals there. When we make an argument, um, uh, it can be named whatever we want, and uh, this is doesn't have to be a number. It doesn't have to be any particular type of data, but it's something that uh, conceptually we want when we run the function in which it's defined. We want to be able to say, okay, on this evaluation. I'm going to pass this value in for this argument. Like I want val to be five, or I want val to be ten, or whatever. Um, so you know, we'll often give these some sort of default value. Uh, but variables, on the other hand, local variables, these are just—it's um, just a way to name things. It's not necessarily an input to the function, but um, you know, if you have if you have lots of things that you're combining together mathematically, uh, it's it's very clunky to if you don't have names to to refer to those things. So. So uh, variables are just kind of like a placeholder for something. So um, we're going to say uh, sig equals uh, pink noise dot ar and uh, uh, times 0.2. And what we can do now is is say uh, we will run this. It's a function. We didn't do dot play anywhere, but we did save the function as sound. So we can say uh, sound dot play. And we'll run this, and we should hear 
uh, pink noise in the left channel. And I'm going to hit uh, command period to stop this. So functions are very general, right? They can contain sound producing classes. They can contain just sort of numerical manipulation. It's really up to you to put whatever in here um, you want to happen. Uh, something else I, I want to mention about functions is that, uh, or, or really just uh, evaluating code in general, uh, if we um, say, um, you know, put like uh, five, uh, or let's say, let's put the number one on the last line here. And let's run this function and then play it. So we don't hear anything. Um, but uh, if we take away this one, it works again. So functions uh, return the value of the last statement. Um, uh, let's 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 do another. Instead of playing this, what if we say dot value? So we have this function. We declare a variable, and it's pink noise times point two. And if we evaluate this function, basically strictly language side, not actually doing anything with the server, it says uh, the result is a binary op ugen. And this is a, a sort of a behind the scenes class that you get when you multiply uh, a signal generator by a number. Um, but if we, again, bring our one back here, now the function returns a one. And, you know, so if we actually were to save this, then, you know, that's the, the function returns uh, the value of its last line, which is one. Uh, so that's that's an important thing to keep in mind, uh, particularly if you are using a function to produce a signal, because um, if we uh, if you end with something that is not the signal that you want to hear, uh, the function is going to try to play whatever that is. So um, uh, that's, let's see, why didn't that work? Did I not rerun this? Yeah, right. Forgot to run sound function after I evaluated it. Um, okay. So uh, just take a, let's take a quick detour here. And I just want to talk about a few convenient things you can, you can use to visualize your work as you go. Uh, the first of which is the server meters. Uh, there's a bunch of tools here. So show server meter, the, uh, the key binding is uh, command M. So that brings up a little, uh, some, some level meters here. So you can see we've got input from my microphone right as I'm talking. And if we play our, our pink noise again, it shows up on the, um, on the left speaker. And let you change the amplitude. So these are just great. I mean, if you don't if you don't hear anything, there are, there are situations where you can bring up the level meters, and you you think you think to yourself, why am I not hearing anything? If you see signal level but you don't hear anything, um, that could mean that there's something wrong with the your synthesis, or it's it's producing like a tone that's too low for your ears to to perceive, but um, it's it still has an amplitude nonetheless. But if you're playing, if you're, if you're running code and you don't hear anything and you don't see anything, that's a sign that something else is wrong. Like maybe you forgot to boot the audio server or um, maybe you're accidentally multiplying by zero somewhere. So it's just really, really great in, in all types of audio software to be able to see the signals you're working with in some way um, in addition to hearing them. Uh, so there's also the, um, the scope, shift command M. Um, let's see if we, if we just run this again here. So you can see there's our, our pink noise. You can scale the scale so horizontally and, and vertically uh, depending on your needs. There is also a spectrum analyzer, which is uh, Alt Command M, show freak scope. Um, so this is like if we if we run this, run our pink noise. Uh, we should see uh, the spectrum of pink noise.
and uh, remember, we can also uh, if we if we uh, play a function and actually store the result um, in a variable, um, we can use the the free message x dot free to stop it. So a little bit more elegant than command period. Although I think there's nothing wrong with command period if you're just sort of messing around making sound. Uh, uh, these all have hotkeys, um, so I think it's a uh, command right command m. Oh, you can you can also do it with code. So s dot meter. Uh, there's our server meters, uh, s.scope, and uh, s, no, no, sorry, uh, freak scope dot new with capital F, capital S. Is that not working? No, it worked. This is hidden behind there. Right. And uh, something which I, um, this is another useful one, another sort of pair of useful ones. Uh, s.make GUI brings up this little this little window here and this has a, a volume meter and a mute button on it. It also tells you the status of the server. So if we play our pink noise, we can just adjust the, the global volume of the server. And you can also do, I think, uh, s.volume.gui. Yeah, unfortunately, capital letters, lowercase letters, they all really do matter quite a bit. So do take note of, of that. So this is actually just a stripped down version where it's just the, um, just the the volume slider. So either one of these works. I um, I'm sure there's, um, some of you will really greatly appreciate just having a slider to turn things down. Um, you know, because normally in Super Collider you just have a bunch of code and it it can feel a little unnerving to not have a big fader or knob somewhere that you can just turn down. So all useful things to remember, just little little tools. Uh, comments, before I forget, uh, we can do uh, a single line comment by just doing a double backslash. If we press return, um, you know, Super Collider does, uh, here's an instance where it actually does see uh, a return character as being significant. Um, or it's sort of visible to Super Collider. Um, so, so basically when you use this syntax, it's got to be on a single line, so you can't hit the return character. But if you want to do a multi-line comment, you use this syntax here where you do a, a forward slash asterisk and then an asterisk forward slash. So this is a multi-line comment, which means we can actually evaluate this code, right? or if it's in a function somewhere, if it's part of code that Super Collider is executing, it's it's the same thing as if we just were to highlight uh, 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 an empty space, so just like a space character. It says nil because there's there's nothing there. Uh, okay, uh, what is x now? A variable of what type? Um, x is uh, an object called a synth. Um, uh, synth is something we'll get to in probably the next lecture, but it's a it's a type of it's it's the it's the language side class that represents a synthesis process or a synthesis node that lives on the uh, audio server. And uh, no, we actually can't use X to play the sound again. Uh, sound till the sound is the function that is defined to produce a particular type of signal. In this case, half amplitude pink noise. And then uh, sound dot play is the execution of that sound function. And we're storing the resulting object, uh, a synth, uh, in X. So, uh, but this that's actually a pretty good transition. We can we can dive into this a little bit more, and let's add an argument uh, called amplitude, and we'll default this. Sorry, again, we don't need the equals there. My mistake. Arg amp equals 0.5, and we're going to put amp right here, and then evaluate this function. Um, so uh, now if we say x uh, equals sound.play, uh, the sound will not have changed. It'll be exactly the same, uh, I think, right? Why is it? Uh, oh, you know what? It's because I, I turned things down, right? I turned things down quite a bit. So let's bring this back up to 0, right? So now if we run this here. Uh, that should be, it's still really quiet. 
Um, I think I might have. Uh, I'm going to quit and reboot the server because I still don't think that should be that quiet. Um, okay. Weird. I, I'm actually not exactly sure. Okay, yeah. I, I just want to address uh, Casey's question real quick, which is uh, if you want stereo sound, uh, Super Collider um, sees uh, the, the, the SC synth, the audio engine, sees an array of signal generators as a multi channel signal. So uh, let's just, I'm just going to make a little space here. Um, so if we say uh, pink noise.ar, uh, with an amplitude of 0.2 dot play, we just get monophonic. But if we make an array that contains uh, this uh, binary op eugen, right, this, this uh, signal construction uh, twice in an array, and all of a sudden we get uh, two pink noise generators, right? So it uh, the, the server sees an array of signals, or an array of eugens, and it says, oh, okay, I have an array. It's a collection of multiple things, so I'm going to put this one in the first speaker. I'm going to put this one in the next speaker. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a really nice shortcut for turning a thing into an array of things. So let's take the, let's take the string hello, and we can say dot dupe. And this produces an array of two things. And th th this is because the default value of dupe is uh, two we can say three, and that gives us an array of three things, an array of eight things, et cetera. So it just basically takes the receiver and uh, makes copies of it and fills an array with this many number of copies. And there's a syntax shortcut, which is the exclamation point followed by a number. So this is the equivalent of dupe two, dupe three, dupe four, et cetera, which means we can just uh, go over here to our, our pink noise, uh, you know, just put it in, uh, parentheses and do exclam two. Right. We could do exclam three, four. We can do more, but we only have two hardware outputs uh, defined right now, so we, it just wouldn't sound any different. Um, the uh, yes, we should talk about AR as well. Um, AR is a, a method uh, that's short for audio rate, and basically, if you're dealing with a signal that you, uh, you want to hear or you want to actually send to your digital to analog converter and uh, play through your speakers, uh, it needs to be an audio rate signal, which means it's producing uh, samples at the sampling rate. And our sampling rate is uh, 44,100 samples. So if we were to do something like pinknoise.kr, which is a control rate unit generator, um, that uh, is a, okay, we forget about our, that for now, our duplication. Uh, it works, doesn't throw an error, but uh, this is a control rate signal, which means it, it plays to a control control rate output, and it's not possible to connect those to our speakers. So AR is, um, it, uh, it says, I want this type of unit generator, and I want it to be running at the audio rate, and, and that's that's how we'll actually hear it. Okay, um, so we let's get back to our argument. Right? We, we were gonna make this uh, amplitude argument here, and we've made this sound function. And now, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and make this stereo. So we're just gonna do exclam two right here. So this turns uh, this pink noise into an array of two pink noise generators. Uh, so we run it and then run this. Great, now it's stereo. Uh, so you might think we can do something like uh, this, uh, but this is not quite right. I don't think this is gonna work. Play is a, is a method which is which, when used uh, with a function, tries to make a, a synth. You know, it assumes there's unit generators inside. The control rate um, uh, iron imp is uh, uh, s dot block size, I think, and it says, uh, oops, and maybe it's s dot options dot block size. Yeah, sixty four. So sixty four samples per control cycle. Uh, so, so now the the way we want to actually uh, specify an argument is we open up parentheses and I think we say args colon and then make a, an array and then we want to say uh, backslash amp uh, 
comma 0 0.1. So now, right, so let's just make this really quiet. So now we have the ability to specify the amplitude of our pink noise uh, at execution time, right? Instead of uh, instead of sort of hard coding it in here, because if we if we comment out this argument, and then if we say um, 0 0.5, uh, we're basically stuck at 0 0.5 all the time. We can change this number all we want, but it's the amplitude is 0 0.5. It's it's being scaled by half amplitude all the time. So this is uh, a very very good, uh, and it's, this is why arguments are uh, useful because you can um, you can make your synthesis parameters uh, modulatable, basically. Um, okay, we we I want to before we I, we got to talk about some more unit generators because there's so many out there. So let's uh, let's just um, modify this a little bit, and let's just talk about some of the basic generators. So we have pink noise which we've heard. There's also uh, white noise. Um, so let's add our amplitude argument back in here. Arg amp equals point, let's do point two. Uh, so this is all working. Yeah. So white noise is basically a different flavor than pink noise. White noise is a uh, uh, equal energy per band. Pink noise is equal energy per octave. So it, it's, uh, it, the spectrum sort of falls off as the frequency gets higher and higher. Um, so those are two pretty handy um, uh, noise generators. But there's also uh, deterministic generators or periodic generators. Uh, so sine OSC is a, a sine wave generator. And if we were to just do this, uh, we would get, uh, I believe, a sine wave. Right. We can make it stereo if we want. And so you might say, okay, well, how's, what's the what's the frequency? Right, we're we're hearing a tone. Uh, we can so we can click on sine osc and again command D, bring up the help file. We can sort of scroll down and see that the default value for sine osc dot ar is uh, 440. And there are there are four arguments altogether. There's the frequency, initial phase in radians, so, so where in the sine wave cycle you want to begin. And then there's something called mull and add. And we haven't been dealing with these, and these are incredibly useful because when you make a unit generator, you want to be able to d define and control its parameters. And the way we do that is by cracking open a, a parentheses enclosure uh, right after the AR method. And so now here we you can see there's a little pop-up that gives us freak, phase, mall, add. So we could, let's just make another argument and we'll say freak uh, times, uh, and we'll multiply our unit generator by amp. So obviously if we run this now, we haven't defined freak. So we've got to say uh, freak equals, let's say 200 and a comma. So this is the syntax for arguments. Freak equals something comma, amp equals something, and then a semicolon at the end of the arg statement. Well, why doesn't exclamp2 need extra parentheses when you put it in the declaration as opposed to adding it to the executed version? Um, put it in the... Uh, not exactly sure, but... Um, I Oh, okay. Actually, this is a good, this is a good point. So let's... When we have... Um, uh, pink noise dot ar um, uh, times zero point two. So I I think I think this is what you're asking. So I put parentheses here and did this, and that actually this is to make sure that this all of this pink noise and point two the multiplication and the result of that is what's duplicated. If I were to get rid of these, um, this is this is considered a, a method, and I think that's going to actually happen first. So what actually happens here is that um, we get that, and then this is multiplied by pink noise. And in this case, it, it's not actually going to matter. But maybe I can give a more a more um, uh, a, a better example. Let's say I want to uh, print. Uh, I want to. I'm debugging, and I want to post some value in the post window. So if I want to say value is, and then I want to concatenate with five, right? 
uh, dot post ln. So post ln is like our, it's, it, it works for any object and it just has the result of posting it in the post window. So here, here it is. And remember when we evaluate code, we also get the result of the last thing we evaluated. That's why we see it twice. Now, if I run this, we get uh, five, and then we also see value is five. Let's see if, if my theory is correct. So now if I put this in parentheses, uh, now it, it, well, it's, it's, it's kind of what I'm trying to explain with the pink noise sort of thing, where uh, the parentheses will say, okay, we're gonna do this first, and then we're gonna post ln this whole thing. Uh, uh, Cody, if you're getting a parse error, that means you've got a syntax error somewhere. So, uh, like for example, you'd get that if you forgot a semicolon. Uh, so I think this is the same error. So syntax error, unexpected, or it, I mean, I'm not getting specifically parse, but it, it. I think that's like if you if you put a weird character in there. Yeah. So here's a parse error. So I just uh, plugged in an extra asterisk here and and. It has no idea what that means. That, that's not a meaningful thing. So I'm getting a parse error. So it just means you've, you've got an extra character or you're missing a character or something. It, see, in the error message, look at the little caret marks and it's going to try to tell you where it stopped making sense. And then you can just sort of trace your way backwards and see if there's something that's inconsistent with what I've done. Um, so, um, and on this topic, I just want to also point out that SuperCollider doesn't uh, do... Um, uh, order of operations, the way you've learned it in like high school and middle school, like please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So uh, three plus four times five. If we were to run this line here, um, those of you who uh, were, were good math students, you remember that multiplication comes first and then addition. So this, we'd expect to see 23 here, but we get 35. That's because it's super collider just kind of goes left to right, just method, 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 method. So three plus four is seven times five is 35, but we can force it to do certain things uh, in a particular order by just uh, using parentheses. So the bottom line with all of this uh, is that when in doubt, if you're getting any weird things, you know, uh, it's good to uh, really check to see if you're doing multiple things on one line, what needs to happen first, either put it on a separate line or just put parentheses around it and that will make sure that this happens first. So that's why this works, it prints the whole, the whole uh, expression and without it it's gonna it's this is the string concatenated with five dot post ln so this is what we post five and then we also see the result of the whole line it's the the fact that superclutter always returns or, or not returns but posts the last thing you evaluate is convenient but at times it can also be kind of confusing okay uh yeah it is that's that's a good assessment it just has to do with the way superclutter uh deals with order of execution Okay, uh, so now we have uh, defined this function, which we've got a frequency and an amplitude, which means we can, uh, let's, let's grab this and pull it up here. Clean think a little bit. So now we can say uh, we, our amp is, let's make it you know, a little bit quieter. And we can also specify frequency by saying freak comma uh, 100. So that's, uh, you might not be able to hear that if you're like on your phone or on an iPad or whatever, but let's bring it up a little bit. All right, so now we've got frequency control. And uh, we, uh, the double plus is correct. That's not an increment. Yeah, SuperCollider doesn't do the, um, the C++ style uh, incrementation. It is a concatenator. So it basically will um, concatenate collections. So like strings or arrays, I think that also works. So if we have the array one, two, three, and double plus plus, or um, four, five, six, this will give us the array one, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, sorry. Uh, now we don't always, we're not always stuck uh, specifying uh, the frequency on instantiation. We can actually modify the uh, the frequency as it's playing. So let's let's make this like 400, and I'm going to use instead of a now we've already got the synthesis function. And in fact, if we open up the node tree, uh, show node tree, alt command T. Uh, let's let me just bring this up here. You can see here uh, this little guy right here, one one eight one temp seventy seven. That is our 
synth node. And I'm going to lose my mind if we do this in mono for too long, so I'm just going to make that stereo. Uh, and now we can say x.set, freak, comma, 300. Right? And we can say x.free. Uh, let's see. Um, it's, uh, it's, I, I'm get, I see a lot of questions, and definitely when we start getting into synthesis, it's uh, so uh, contrast to add args in play. Can we do sound dot value? Uh, yeah, but uh, I think to you'd have to make a function outside of the function. Uh, so um, we'd have to do uh like func equals uh arg my freak um uh you know something something like this and then you would say you know dot play here we'd actually just play the function straight away uh to fix to fix some um, indentations you can just select everything command a and then hit tab that's a really nice shortcut so right so this function is now i think what we'd say we we don't actually need these. Right, we can actually we can just put these out here. Freak, amp. Um, let's try that. So now we have a function uh, with two arguments, and the last the last line of the function is to play a sound function, and it's going to call it sound. So I think now with this we can say uh, func dot value. Uh, one thousand point three, and that should play it. Yeah, we can hit command period, or we can also say sound dot free, right? So we can say let's go down to five hundred. Yeah, so that that is that is how we can use our our, our function dot value construction to actually make sound. You have to put a a, a playable ugen function uh, as the result of a an outer function if that makes sense i've done this before but it's um definitely we're not gonna we don't need to get too heavy on the nesting especially on the first couple of assignments or something um okay in addition to uh play there's also plot so let's we might come back to this but let's again i just want to make some space here just so it doesn't look too cluttered here um if we say pink noise dot ar uh instead of dot play we'll say dot Plot, and we're going to say, give me one second of this. So it takes one second because it's a real-time process, but basically it generates uh, a plot of one second worth. And we can we can say, okay, you know, just that's really that's kind of slow. Let's just, just give me uh, one cent a second worth. So that's that's our pick noise. And we can do the same with um, sine osc. Uh, if we say I want this to be a 100 hertz <laughs> sine wave. Then by plotting uh, just uh, one hundredth of a second, we should see exactly one cycle. And we can say, okay, let's give me um, uh, five hundredths of a second. And so then we can see we've got about five of those. Uh, so um, uh, we we've been uh, what we've been doing is. Um, multiplying by a value to control amplitude. So for example, this would, it looks the same, but uh, if you try this on your own and then actually look at the the vertical scale markings, you can see that the maximum and minimum on this graph are actually 0.1 and negative 0.1 instead of one and negative one. Uh, but uh, we can also, um, let's go back to, back to this example. I'm gonna turn this back into our original sound function. Uh, right. So we have been uh, doing uh, sort of taking a unit generator, which you know may or may not be converted into an array of two identical copies, and then multiplying by amp. And that, that works as an amplitude control. Um, Make sure this is still working. It is not. 
Uh, I'm getting some wacky thing here. So here's a good here's a good um, impromptu message as target not understood symbol amp. Why? Rig amp rig. I think it's getting confused by this. Um, what if we put this on a separate line? Okay. I'm a little mystified here. Um, what about uh, this? Oh, I know why it's not working. Yeah, we should probably wrap up soon. Um, I'll see you later, B. Hanks. Uh, so the, the reason it's not working is because I didn't change this syntax here. Remember, we need to say args, colon, and then in square brackets. This is when we're using a sound function for this purpose. So right, that works. Um, so SignOsc also has uh, other arguments, right? The second one is an initial phase. This is going to control uh, where where the sine wave begins in the cycle. So uh, by the default is 0, which looks like that. But we can say um, if we have it be pi radians out of phase, then it, it begins halfway through that cycle. So we actually start on a down tick. Uh, pi over 2, it'll start at the peak. And 3 pi over 2, I think we can just do this. Yeah, 3 pi over 2. So um, we, can, uh, we can sort of specify phase here if we want. Let's say 0. It doesn't really matter in this case. It's not going to sound any different. And then the third argument is uh, mul. And basically, this is a value that will be multiplied by the, uh, by the unit generator. So we can actually put our amplitude control here and then just get rid of this line. Because we don't need a redundant. It would actually be bad to have an amplitude scaling process twice, because then it gets scaled down twice as much. So uh, this actually works just the same. So we can set our amplitude to um, you know, 0.1. Oops, I gotta spell that correctly, obviously. Uh, right. So uh, other other UGENs that I, I'd like you to check out. Um, let's see, there's some other. Um, there's a pulse. So this is a um, uh, basically a, a pulse wave generator, like a square wave, but you can also change the size of the pulses. So that, uh, let's see, let's just make a few of those just to show you what that looks like. So there's our pulse wave generator. It looks a little wacky, but um, if we were to plot more of that, I think it will it'll, uh, stabilize. So that's basically like a little square wave generator. Um, let's see, there's a sawtooth wave. Oh yeah, right. I forgot. Forgot about all these. Thank you. All right, thanks for pointing that out. So we got a. Uh, this is pulse. This is saw. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I my my phase examples were obscured. Um, let's see. There's also uh, LF tri is a a triangle wave. So this is just sort of a linear ramp up, linear ramp down. Um, there are a couple of uh, sh uh, shift command D is this little help help search browser. There's uh, uh, LF noise zero. This is a non interpolating uh, uh, noise generator. So this basically gives you random little staircases. It actually looks kind of periodic. That's just purely a coincidence. It's kind of like repeating almost, but uh, you know it's it is trust me it is random. Uh, so LF noise 0 is basically non-interpolated noise. LF noise 1 is going to give you, basically it's going to generate random points again, but it's going to connect them with lines. And um, this is, uh, like, let's just do a quick example here. Um, let's make, a, instead of a, an argument called freak, we'll say uh, freak is going to be, 
uh, LF noise zero. And I'm going to use KR here because we're not actually going to be listing this one. But uh, let's say I want to say um, uh, frequency H. Um, and the range is going to be, let's see, 100 to 1,000. And we're going to use this signal generator for the frequency. So this is going to generate eight random values per second between a minimum and maximum here, and it's going to be non-interpolated. So it's going to sound like this. And you know, we, could, we could slow this down. So we get two values per second. Oops. And if we use uh, LF noise one, then we get these linear interpolations between random values. And other ones to check out, um, uh, line, which is just generates a line from a start value to an end value over some number of seconds. Uh, X line will do the same thing, but uses an exponential curve instead of a straight line. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we, we got through um, most of what I wanted to cover. I know this this feels kind of sort of slapdash, but uh, you know it's a, it's a lot to cover. But if you have any questions, you know, get in touch. Um, I can stick around for uh, another uh, five or ten minutes if anyone's got any last minute questions. Uh, but I think we're hopefully we're at a at a at a good point uh, at least to do uh, first sort of set of in class problems on Thursday. Um, so yeah, I'm going to sort of officially dismiss at this point and I'll be sure to upload this to my YouTube channel. Um, yeah, Super Collider is open source. Uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, I, I know it's, 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 it's basically all on GitHub now, so you can, you can find, if you just go to GitHub and search for Super Collider, you can download the, um, source code and then. Uh, this is, uh, supercollider.github.io is kind of like the official page, so you can probably find a lot of links. Uh, stream schedule is going to be this this hour on this day, so Tuesday, uh, eleven to twelve uh, in the morning, uh, for the foreseeable future. I think the last stream is going to be like the first week of December. There might be a few. I mean, like the when I when I do the midterm exam, uh, there's probably not going to be a stream that week. We also have Thanksgiving Thanksgiving week off. Um, the maximum frequency in KR, well, um, so the maximum frequency in uh, in AR, I mean, you know, the, the, if you're familiar with the sampling theorem or the Nyquist frequency, the highest frequency that can be represented is half the sampling rate. So with an AR generator, uh, that's um, uh, half the sampling rate, so 22,050 hertz. And the control rate uh, is uh, by default 64 samples per block. So it's uh, basically you just divide that value by 64. And uh, so basically any control rate generator that has a frequency and it's running at or near or above 344, it's going to alias. And so it's going to give you, it's it's just going to, um, you're not going to get what you think you're getting. So basically if you're ever dealing with, um, if, if you want to hear a unit generator, obviously you have to use AR. But if you've got some process that's controlling some other synthesis process, you know you can use KR. But if it's actually running at a really high frequency, if it's like around 344 or higher, you should use AR because that'll make it a, a full a full resolution at the sample rate unit generator. And there are some examples I could cook up where you can actually hear the difference between KR and AR, even if you're not actually listening to it. Um, yeah, no, th uh, that's a good question. The as far as content. I'm I'm gonna be kind of uh, making a rough plan and improvising, and I'm I'm basing this semester's streams off of uh, the assignments that I assigned uh, two years ago, what I put on the syllabus and the lecture stream. So I'm kind of building off of the um, off of the playlist from two years ago. So it'll be similar. It won't be identical. Um, I mean, the the main reason I do it this way is so that I can actually interact with chat and answer questions if people have them. So so yeah, it'll be. I, I would say it's it's probably going to be more similar than it is different, uh, but I, I whenever I can I'll, I'll sort of see what kind of questions people have and especially towards the end of the semester we might just depending on how the semester goes we might uh, do something that is not at all in the in the playlist from two years ago.
looking over my looking over my notes. Uh, yeah, I guess I covered just about everything, maybe in a pretty crazy order. But um, yeah, if there's anything that comes up over the course of the week, I'll try to address it at the beginning of the stream next week. And right, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna call it here. Uh, I'll upload this to a new playlist on my YouTube channel. And I will stream again uh, same time, same time next week. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week.